Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and it's time for some more Warhammer Free gameplay. Did you think it was only going to be one video today? We've seen some demons, but now it's time to go to the Far East and feel a little bit cold and aloof with Meow Ying. Meow Yin is of course the Storm Dragon, who heralds the defense of the Great Bastion in Grand Cafe, one of two legendary lords. So, we've got a few things to show off, including some quality of life changes that are coming in the game through means of diplomacy and so on, which made a lot of sense to show off with her, and as always, if there's any spoilers and so on, such as story-wise, I'll have that marked off on YouTube chapters so you're not getting anything ruined. But with all that being said, let's not waste any more time and jump right in. Grand Cathay, a vast empire to the east, ruled by powerful creatures, dragons, who can inhabit human form. You are gravely mistaken. We have no interest in a mere god's power. No interest in power to use against the forces of chaos? I am Yao Yi, the Storm Dragon. Older than the gods themselves. You are here for a greater purpose. This map shows the energy of all things. There should be harmony, but the world is unbalanced. My younger sister, Shenzhou, bringer of light and hope. She ventured beyond the Norskan Mountains but was lost. Without her, without her light, darkness prevails, and our family has no comfort. Though I feel your loss, the Tome of Fates provides no insight to your sister's whereabouts. Ursa knows he witnessed her fate. Then why does he not tell you, Iron Dragon? There is mistrust between dragons and gods. If we save Urson, he will tell us how to find Shen Zhu. Let me serve you, mighty dragons. I can reach Urson, lead you to him before it's too late, for one drop of his blood. Your destiny is to guide us. The armies of Cathay must breach the Maelstrom and march into chaos. Balance will be restored to the world when Shenzhou is returned to you. Our goal is clear to find the lost sister. We must hear the God Bear's testament before he passes into myth. I am the anointed guardian of the Great Bastion. Any breach brings great dishonor upon me. So prove your worth, mortal. Yes, Great Matriarch. There is indeed a rupture in the Great Bastion. The forces of Tzich invade through the ruins of the Snake Gate and have taken the Terracotta Graveyard. Further along, the Bastion remains under threat from the Changer's forces, or, as you know him, the dread power Qian Chi. Yet, despite the enemy assaults, there remain brave defenders ever loyal to you. Bolster them, and they will gladly confederate with a revered dragon. You will need such allies, for it is on the other side of the wall where the threat is strongest. The eternal siege continues, for the dark powers are never sated. And there, the orchestrator of this woe, Kairos Fateweaver, face this demonic oracle, lest he bring down the bastion. Fateweaver is insidious. And the invasion is only part of his plan. Rebellion festers in Nanyang's minds under the Changer's malign influence. Punishment must be swift to reinforce your authority. 
Before we can hope to take the fight into the Chaos Realms themselves, we must bring Harmony back to Grand Cathay. There is much to do. I yearn for my true form. So here we are with Miao Yin, and as you can expect we start with a fairly decent army, some mid-tier units and obviously some artillery, as this faction is going to be in war quite a lot. You're going to be constantly dealing with the threat of chaos to your north. So at the very beginning of a campaign we need to start building up our forces, getting rid of any of the Cathayan rebels which may be around, and starting to solidify our defences. The Dragon Emperor commands it of course. Just by zooming out you can already see where you're being thrown into. You'll notice that you do have a lot of enemies surrounding you. Some Xinqian forces have already breached the Snake Gate and that remains destroyed. You're going to want to build that up as soon as possible but you'll also notice some Cathayan rebels right below you. You are playing as the faction closest to the Chaos Waste and you can notice that there's quite a few enemies there. More will spawn over time but we'll get to that in a second. But you'll be also supported by Cathayan factions. Diplomacy can be quite useful here. Especially Especially once you keep in mind that there are three different gates that guard the entrance to Grand Cafe from the Northern Realms. If you can keep some allies supported you should be able to just focus on one gate and work around the campaign without having to focus on three. At the very beginning of your campaign there is an enemy army in your region like in most other Total War games and this is a relatively easy army, just a peasant stack which is obviously there for newer players to get their bearings around the game, nothing too dangerous so you can easily auto resolve it as bigger and far more impressive battles will show up very soon. Also, as you defeat this army, this will trigger one of the first Cathayan quests, which will automatically give you access to an Astromancer. This is a spellcaster with the Law of Heavens. That means that you'll have access to a dedicated spellcaster, and also Miao Yin, who has access to a mix of laws from the Law of Life and the Law of Yin. Miao Ying's faction effects, known as Ruler of the Northern Provinces, has the following benefits. Corruption, minus 2. Leadership, plus 10% when fighting against Demons of Chaos. That was the black bar that was shown off a while ago. And finally, Ammunition, plus 20% for missile units. On your faction screen just here, you'll also be able to see what type of climates you'll be able to use, how many armies you have. And finally, you can also notice that you start at war with quite a few factions, mostly Chaos themed, and we'll have to deal with them as time progresses. Miao Yin's own character effects are as follows. Upkeep minus 50% for missile infantry units in Lord's Army and Harmony plus 3 for Yin. You'll also notice other effects but this is the perfect time to talk about this new system with the items and so on as there's quite a few changes. And obviously the Demon Prince was not the best time to showcase that off as he has something dedicated directly for him. The item system is now a bit easier where it's divided between magic items and auxiliaries and you can see everything there clearly laid out as to what magic item is what and what auxiliaries or what, it makes it a little easier to move around from. This is a big change to make things a lot more user friendly as the previous system was more of a nuisance with too many drop down menus. Not only that, but you can see here a little later down the campaign that two new functions have been added. One of the functions is being able to get two lesser quality items and fusing them together to make something of a higher rarity all the way up to blue also known as rare quality, and if you don't want to be able to do that but you are in desperate need of some cash, you're also able to sell off any extra items that you might not need, anything that might not be useful to your chosen faction or playstyle, or if you find yourself in a very big war and need some extra funds, you can sell off some items just to be able to fund your war effort. This of course is a big quality of life change as anyone with experience with the prior Warhammer games, it becomes a bit of an issue with loads of items that you might not even use, so you can upgrade them or just get some more cash. But let's not take any attention away from the Storm Dragon as I imagine that she doesn't like that. As always, three of her normal skill lines are the usual. At the very bottom you've got the basic administration one which focuses around public order and so on. A little bit on top of that is boosting up your units with more attack power, ammunition, all that different type of stuff. And then obviously she's got the typical one which can boost her own capabilities in battle. We obviously don't need to spend too much time here so let's start moving towards the more unique skills. Miao Yin will also be able to cast some spells, having access to a special mix of spells between the Law of Life and the Law of Yin. All the spells will be cycled through on screen right now, and mostly from what my experience has been is that it's more focused around a defensive style of play, which is not hard to imagine considering that her background follows the defense of the Great Bastion itself. 
lots of different healing and buff spells to be able to boost up the capabilities of your warriors as you're constantly bombarded by the threat of chaos. But keep in mind that she'll not be able to cast every single spell whilst in dragon form, as you'll have to switch around between both forms. Miao Yin will also have access to her own unique skill line which will be available to you as from rank 13. The skill line itself is quite varied, but it mostly focuses around boosting up the capabilities of the Great Bastion, keeping the nation of Cafe under control whilst also improving your relations with other Cafean factions, reducing the cooldown of certain spells, and also increasing the capabilities of your warriors and damage output against any chaotic factions which may start invading you, and this will be a regular occurrence, so it is quite quite helpful. Two of the skills themselves are a heavy emphasis on missile units as she focuses on the yin aspect which is range. Now let's talk about construction in Grand Cafe as it's a little bit different to what most people are used to. Your provincial capitals, your settlement capitals, landmarks, resource, basic military and advanced military buildings will remain the same, nothing really changes here. But this is where things start to change in the form of defense buildings and infrastructure buildings. You will notice that you have quite a large amount of different options, mainly because there are two different types of buildings, one focusing on yin and the other focusing on yan. This is part of your harmony mechanic which we'll get into a little bit later. But as you can see, if you build a yin building, you won't be able to build the equivalent in a yan building. The different mirroring buildings will also have some minor differences, so it also depends on your actual place style and what you need at the time. Though from my experience, thinking ahead when planning some construction also does benefit you greatly. So let's talk about Harmony now. This is a unique mechanic only available to Cafean factions. Right now, of course, there are only two Cafean playable factions, that of Miao Yin and that of Zhao Ming. Harmony is the lifeblood of Grand Cafe divided between two factors known as Yin and Yang. When working in balance, many benefits come to you, but when the scales tip in one direction, you might get some benefits and some negatives in relevance to the other. As you can see here, at the very start of your campaign with Miao Yin, you are in the balance focusing on Yin. Keeping as close to the balance as possible is the best option that you have for your cafe and campaigns, as if you stray too far from the balance, it will eventually start giving more and more negatives. At one point I do believe I had minus 10 control, which is public order, throughout my settlements. However, if you're able to get harmony sorted, this is by a mixture of buildings, technology, characters and events, well, you can get a lot of bonuses as you can see on screen right now. I'd say from a gameplay point of view, it's relatively easy to keep harmony up, as long as you're paying attention as to what you're building. There are so many contributing factors, it might seem a bit overwhelming at the beginning, but I've been able to start realizing, okay, if I'm doing this, I need to do this here, and so on and so forth. Mind you, you don't need to always have harmony up. Yes, there are some negatives if you fall more on the line of yin or the yang, but you still get some benefits too, and it's more specific towards your general playstyle, although Harmony does provide the most bonuses. Your units themselves will also have a Harmony mechanic. Melee units will fall under Yang, and ranged units will fall under Yin. When apart, they will act as normal, however, in the battlefield when you've got both units together as a mix, then you'll also get some benefits, with some higher tier units providing larger benefits. I'll further expand upon Harmony in its own video when I'm not so time-gated, but you can see here in regards to battle, when you look at your unit cards, at the top they've got a mixture of symbols. When it's full with both Yin and Yan, that means that they are in Harmony. When they are apart, they won't have said symbol, so you'll know that they're not getting benefits of being close to range units and so on. The style of play when it comes to Cafean battles is mostly quite defensive or moving your force together as one complete unit. But don't worry, you are more than able to move around and do damage and not be always in harmony. Now, as we're talking, this is the very first battle that you can fight against the peasant stack, and this is one of the land battles that you'll be facing in Cafe. There are a lot of maps, I'll be showing a few off throughout this video, including some minor settlements, but I'll be showing the grand majority of them on a different embargo, as obviously I'm time-gated right now and I'm not able to show off custom battles just yet. Still on the subject of Harmony is also the Technology tab, where you'll have a rather large mix of different technologies split between three separate branches, 
each of them dedicated in their own way. The upper parts normally focus around Yang, which will have some benefits towards certain units, mostly around melee focus, and will also affect your alignment with Yang. In the middle, you'll focus mostly around some administrative stuff, though that can be found in all three sections. And then the bottom branch is the yin section, which will focus around range units and also some administrative sections. What I'll do now for just about another minute or so is allow the game volume to play so I can scroll through all the rest of the technology tab. That way, if you're interested to find out now, you're able to do so and possibly plan ahead for your campaigns. But I'll have a more detailed video and discussion regarding the technology tabs for each of the specific races as soon as I am able to. Now let's talk about the Cathayan Caravan mechanic, something that is only unique to them. You might recall earlier in the video I said that you have two armies to start with, yet I've only shown you one. Well, the caravan itself is your second army. But you won't be controlling this army in the same way that you control all others. Your caravan has a cargo and you're able to increase that cargo as you go along. That cargo is then sent to various different areas throughout the Warhammer map that is available to you, and of course if there's a direct route to you, which then you'll be able to sell and hopefully make a profit, it depends as to what city you go to. As you can see as I'm scrolling around the map, you have a various different points where you can go to, they will obviously take different amounts of turns. The further away, the more it will take, and the better the profit in most cases. Obviously you want to make more money, but more money also means more risks. So you have to plan ahead sometimes and make sure that you're not throwing your caravan into a possible battle that might see them getting destroyed. After you've set your caravan out on a mission, they will then appear in the city that they're going out from, which is normally around your capital city. Normally caravans, as far as I've seen, have random troops, but it's generally enough to keep them going for a decent amount of time, and early on they will have some powerful troops to keep them safe. The caravan master leading said caravan is also a lord choice, so you'll have a bunch of different skills here, focusing around a wide variety of different things. Obviously you'll be able to increase your cargo, and the income that you'll get as a payload when you sell said cargo. But there are also a variety of different skills, for example boosting up the capabilities of said character, increasing the melee range and so on capabilities of your soldiers, as that will be very useful considering that you're moving around with a bit of your own cash. So having a good defense and obviously offense is very useful here. You'll have to try and balance the skills out as well as possible as you'll want more cargo but you'll want your troops to be strong. It really much depends as to when you'll start using caravans. Early on it might not seem like caravans will be too useful but getting some extra income even if it's 10 turns down the line or 5 turns down the line depending on where you decide to go will help you get a leg up especially as you're being invaded constantly by chaotic forces. 
you are also more than able to recruit more caravans and have them going around as much as possible, but they are an army after all and it will affect your funds, you'll not want to have too many at the very start of your campaign. There are a lot of events tailored around caravans, I'll go over a few, one generic one that most people already know about, where you can be ambushed or meet with ogres in battle. Some other factions will also be able to do this I imagine, but I've not been able to see that happen. The choice here was to either fight the ogres or sacrifice a unit of warriors with halberds. Now obviously I don't want to do that because warriors with halberds are kitted out to fight ogres as being anti-large, so I am more than willing to meet them in battle. Early on these ogres aren't too much of a threat, they mostly come with noblars at the very beginning, so you should be able to get in there and learn the Cathayan army a little bit better. Not all of the events themselves are aggressive, as you can see here, a high elf noble wishes to join my party. It benefits him to keep him safer, and it brings us a few more troops. A high elf noble is a decent melee fighter and I could always do with an extra one. Now what you will also notice at this point is when we pan over to my caravan, which is right now halfway in between the Darklands I believe. This is fairly later in a campaign, I've been kind of moving around and just exploring whilst also trying to make a profit. I had an ogre hunter show up at one point and he also offered his services. Now I would love to have a big ogre around with my forces, as you know, you can use them for a few things. My caravan now is looking a little stronger and hopefully they'll be able to survive the turns to come. This will be the final caravan related event that I'll show, which my caravan has been travelling and found some cargo, lost from a previous caravan perhaps, but now we have the choice, we can use it to replenish our forces, or we can take it upon us and sell it for a bigger profit. As I've already fought against some ogres, some replenishment will obviously be quite useful. There are still many more caravan related events to show up, and eventually I will cover them all, something like recruiting full units and so on, but until then, let's start moving on with the video. Now, there's still a lot more to talk about in regards to campaign stuff for Miao Yin and Grand Cafe, but before we do so, how about we look at some minor settlements? The first being a minor Cathayan settlement right next to your capital of Nangao. As I said, this is a minor settlement and you can see some defensive structures, as you can already imagine from all the siege rework stuff. There's multiple layers, there's different little choke points. This is a common theme throughout Warhammer 3, but I'll be able to showcase a few settlements that I've been battling through throughout this video. Minor settlements themselves also vary in size, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the game to to play a little bit and showcase some of the ones that I was fighting in. Still faithful. Miao Ying will get access to the Wuxing War Compass at turn 4. Here you'll be able to set the compass in a certain direction and be able to get benefits. Each direction of course has different benefits as you can see on the screen right now and it's up to you and your chosen playstyle. In regards to myself, I know that Miao Ying is going to be dealing with a lot of chaos invasions as time progresses, so it's probably smart in my opinion to get growth sorted and get my settlements up and running, especially as I will want to start recruiting some more powerful units before the forces of chaos are able to do so. You aren't able to switch the direction of the compass as you please, there is a cooldown for a number of turns, but you should be able to notice the benefits. Later on if you find yourself dealing with some control issues, especially if you're recruiting too many of Yin or Yang units, getting some extra control is obviously very beneficial with Dragon Emperor's Wrath. 
Early on you can recruit an army, especially if you're working towards the rebels in the south, you do have some Xenchian forces to deal with the north, and you have to keep an eye on the snake gates, which right now is in ruins. We do have a different amount of choices here when it comes to possible Lord choices, the normal one being the Lord Magistrate, which is a melee focused character, but there is also the Dragon Blooded, which has access to either the Law of Yin or the Law of Yang. These are spell laws only available to Grand Cafe. I decided to go for a character with the Law of Yin, however keep in mind that that also affects your Harmony too, as you can see that my Harmony balance has shifted totally towards Yin. This is when I'll start taking some more negatives, so eventually I'm going to have to start focusing some young buildings too. As we are aware, the two different spell laws also act in harmony towards each other, the Law of Yin being more focused on defensive spells. I will have a video later on in the future, when I'm more able to, detailing both Cafean spell laws in as much detail as possible and their uses on the battlefield. And yes, the Dragon Blooded Lords will also make use of some bound spells throughout some other laws of magic, further improving their capabilities as spellcasters, as they'll have access to a few more spells than most wizards do. Another quality of life change will be how dilemmas work. You can see here that a dilemma's popped up in turn 6. And we have both a positive trait or a negative trait that we can get. However, the negative will also then give us some cash to compensate us for taking a negative trait. This depends on your playstyle and of course if you need money at the moment. Nobody wants a negative trait, but if you find yourself being attacked constantly, you might need a bit of extra cash to upgrade some walls or recruit some units quite quickly. So in the lore and story of Warhammer 3, we know that Miao Ying has a certain job to keep. She needs to protect the Great Bastion from the forces of chaos. As we can see here, it's turn 7, and the threat of a growing chaos invasion grows ever more. In fact, there are also different modifiers here, which will increase the chance or the speed as which chaos invasions appear. With the Snake Gate currently destroyed, chaos forces are massing faster and faster, and eventually will launch an invasion. We can see here, it's only going to take one more turn until they do so. As you can see here, I've got a small Chaos Invasion starting, and it's very early campaign so it's not too much of a threat. In fact, also the other Cafean faction having settled out there keeps the other Chaos armies at bay for a small while. This allows me to deal with any weak rogue armies at the moment I can pick out fast, and then resettle the Great Bastion in an effort to solidify my position in Grand Cafe. Resettling the Great Bastion means that my forces are weak, but this is quite early on, and I've been able to deal with the Chaos Factions prior, you can also notice that some allies had come to join the fray just in case. Now, the city itself is something different. The Great Bastion can only really be used by Cafean forces, and you're able to build up a variety of different buildings as you can see here. There is of course the provincial capital, the military buildings, and then the defensive buildings. Each of them are quite varied, and it depends on your playstyle once again. There's lots to choose from, but keep in mind that each gate itself from the Great Bastion only has four building slots. Depending on how you've built up your settlements near the Great Bastion, you might not even need the basic or advanced military buildings. The Bastion itself will have its own dedicated commandments, which you can see on screen right now. These are only available to that of Great Bastion buildings, so you have access to three different ones if you capture the whole Bastion. As these settlements are your frontline defense, they are generally quite powerful, like for example plus 200 unit experience per turn which these affect local armies. I must admit I've been using this to boost up my other armies before I send them out to attack other nations too. But while we're on the topic of commandments, you might find it interesting to note that there are five different commandments for your normal Cafean provinces, and they all directly mention each of the five active Cafean dragons that are the children of the Dragon Emperor and the Moon Empress. Who knows what this means for the future, but we currently have two out of the five dragon children active throughout Cafe at the moment. And lastly, we'll look towards Diplomacy, as I found Diplomacy to be rather important for Miao Yin. Diplomacy has seen a rather extensive rework when it comes to Warhammer 3, and this is very obvious here. You're now able to trade settlements, which can solidify yourself, especially when potential alliances. Here we have Zhao Ming, the Iron Dragon, and we have control of a settlement which falls under his province, the City of Monkeys. I have taken that away from Deathmaster Snickich, and I don't really need the city, but I do want some extra cash, so with this I'm able to trade the city, but get a decent amount of cash, a trade agreement, and a non-aggression pact. 
You can also see that the modifiers for diplomacy are now clearly listed when you hover over the number, which will make things a lot easier. Now Zhao Ming can focus on working his way down south, and I can focus around the Great Bastion and completing the campaign. Obviously this then ties to the video that I released earlier, where I would go into the realm of chaos itself and try to attain the Demon Souls. Now I'm not going to show that again here, as the next video coming out will focus directly on the four individual realms of chaos and what you need to do in all of them. But with this video you've been able to see a lot of changes coming in Warhammer 3, a bunch of new settlements, how Grand Cafe plays in the campaign aspect, and more or less what you should be doing when Cafe eventually releases on February 17th. What do you think about Grand Cafe, specifically Miao Ying's faction? It won't be too long until I can have a video regarding Zhao Ming and his faction, but until then, let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and let's start a bit of a discussion. But with that, my friends, we've come to the end of our video. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, might I suggest giving the video a like, or even subscribing to the channel, as it really does help us out. In the description section below are various links to different social media platforms, such as Facebook, Instagram, and Discord. Also in the description section is an affiliate link with Element Games where you could buy loads of hobby based products, not just Warhammer, for 10 to 25% off. Making a purchase using that link and also our special code, which is also in the description, supports the channel at no extra cost to you, which we think is rather cool. A big thank you to our patrons, your support means the world to us, it's amazing that people want to help a small channel like us grow and get to a higher level of content. A big thank you to Gibraltar LUSC, Ryan Birch, Andrew Prince and Okro for subscribing to us at our fame level, you guys are super cool. And a big thank you to Edward Yule, VS Fasan, Aaron Whitman and Shaggy for subscribing to us at our king level, honestly we can't thank you all enough. And lastly, a big thank you to all of you for liking, sharing and commenting on these videos. Honestly, it's because of you guys that the channel has been growing at such a great pace lately, so we can't thank you all enough. But with that my friends, thank you so much for watching once again, and we shall see you all again very very soon. Have a good day.